1995, American pop culture found a new phrase to speak. Actress Alicia Silverstone's character in the popular movie Clueless served her car to avoid killing a bicyclist. As a laugh line, she said, whoops, my bad. Well, from there, the street phrase took on a new life as a way of expressing a semi-apology for some mistake. We say, my bad, when we forget an appointment or shatter a dish on the kitchen floor, and it's a good thing to admit a mistake we've made. It could be a clue, however, that we recognize something far more significant about our human nature. My bad could lead us to better understand ourselves and our relationship with God. Welcome to Tracks for the Journey. I'm Larry Payne, your host. I seek in every episode to build your well-being through progressive Christian spirituality, psychology, history, and science. So today, we enter the debates over human nature and our relationship to God that stretch back to the dawn of human history. Perhaps it's time to take a new look to uncover what people who do bad things can learn about themselves and the goodness of God. I don't need to waste your time bringing evidence that human beings do really bad things. You yourself may have been the victim of crime or felt the sting of angry words. Scenes of war are on the national news and lies distort public debate. I'll have to admit that I've done my share of bad actions, angry words, and moral sins. The more important question is, why? What is wrong with human beings? And the explanations offered for the reality of human misbehavior have proposed many factors, such as uncontrolled basic instincts, anxiety, cultural conditioning, or the quest for power. Now, traditional Christian doctrine offers a theological reason. Humans are sinful. The doctrine of original sin states that Adam passed on a nature of a sin that has affected every human being and placed all under the judgment of God to die. God, because of this, cannot have a meaningful relationship with anyone because of these failures. More than admitting my bad, this theology says that no one can do anything spiritually worthwhile. Each person is spiritually dead and unable of their own volition to connect with God. Perhaps you've been taught that kind of teaching, that we aren't people who do some wrong things, but people who have a total depravity of good. The ideas have left many with scars of estrangement, hopelessness, and shame. I think this classical theology fails on multiple counts. First, no scientific evidence supports the notion that all of humankind descended from one person, as the ancients thought. We are products of millennia of evolutionary development and varied lines of subspecies. It's impossible to identify one ancestor as the progenitor or even the representative of everyone else. We should see Adam and Eve as figurative of every person, not actual residents who birthed the human race with a sin gene in our DNA. Second, we know millions of people around the globe have lived with love, compassion, wisdom, and beauty in the context of many faith traditions. This is evidence humans are not dead to moral realities and to pray from inherent wickedness, but alive and capable of striving toward the good as active moral agents. Persons of every nation and religion exhibit extraordinary love and altruism, both of which are hallmarks of a connection with God. Third, I fault classical theology of sin as it considers human nature with three distinct parts of body, mind, and a corrupted soul that's flawed. I think instead, and science teaches us, that each person is a complex unity of self, built of genetic, cultural, and existential differences that are in dynamic interaction. There is no separate entity of the soul locked into evil, but instead a personality with a mix of moral, immoral, wise, foolish, love, and hate. The cruel gang member might choose to die for a friend, 
and the holy priest might choose to abuse an altar boy. We are in a constant flux from birth to death in crafting and recrafting the self we claim to be. This flux exposes us to sin and negative actions that we choose for ourselves. We don't have a soul corrupted by original sin, but we do have a self influenced by original choice. Theologian Karen Strand Winslow writes that biblical stories show the condition, quote, necessary for ethical behavior, such as the ability to choose based on an ability to anticipate consequences, make value judgments, and determine all co alternative courses of action, emphasize original choice, not original sin. Each of us makes bad choices and are responsible for those consequences. And having these capacities is vital. It also afflicts us with the burden of choosing good and bad as a constant in our lives. I'm sure each one of us knows all about this challenge of making good moral choices. Let me ask, how many times have you lied today? Well, your answer is probably a lie too. And the ancients misunderstood many things, but they were right on track when they realized that everyone is capable of great evil and great good. More of my concern today is to ask the question, how can we address the failures of the good in our lives? A part of the way forward in building the best emotional health and social relationships emerges from psychological research. Good, constructive, and beneficial action can come through owning our actions, solidarity with the community, and spiritual renewal. So a foundation of the quest towards well-being is responsibility for our actions. It's not healthy to blame the ancient Adam or the mother who drank too much. Certainly the past does affect our genes and our family of origin, but each moment we are making choices of how we will act. For example, Jose felt brokenhearted when his mother died of COVID, but his buddies laughed at his sadness saying, it happens to everyone, you'll get over it. Jose could have talked to the guys about his real feelings, but it was easier to push those emotions down with another shot of tequila. His choice led to unresolved grief that affected every relationship from then on. Taking responsibility for our actions and understanding that we are influenced by the past but making choices for today is a way forward. Taking responsibility brings the opportunity to make better decisions. James Clear, in his book, Atomic Habits, writes, every action you take is a vote for the type of person you will be. Well, think of that for a moment. If we turn it around, we can say it's also true that the identity you want to be is built on the actions you take day after day. The more we have ownership of our choices, the more we can intentionally build well-being. I think a second consideration is in play for moving away from the bad and the dysfunctional. It is that we can build upon responsibility for our actions by embracing solidarity and community. You know, it's just easier to make the right choices when we see other people as more like us than different from us. We generally think twice about doing something that would hurt members of our family, church, or our neighborhood. Yet, it can be difficult to expand our solidarity. Fear can make us define different as bad. As a white male, I could find it easy to turn away from a predominantly black neighborhood or cast suspicion on a Jewish rabbi different from my own faith. This is a product of what psychology calls implicit bias. Each of us has subconscious filters through which we strain our experiences for example, tall people may be perceived as better leaders without us even thinking about it. Black young men could be perceived as dangerous or poor people as lazy. We can't completely escape these kinds of unconscious distortions, but we can learn to be aware of them 
and to balance them with wisdom and solidarity with the larger community. When I was a Baptist pastor, I attended many baseball games to cheer, cheer on my boys. At one of them, I fell in a conversation with a Catholic priest, Father Tash. Our churches sat side by side on the same street. And over the months, we developed a friendship that broke the barriers of our denominational doctrines, both of which said that the other didn't have the right formula of faith to be approved by God. Over the years that followed, we shared some ecumenical worship services, community projects, and meals. We embraced a solidarity that overcame the differences to build the good. He was a brother of faith that I fully expect to see in the afterlife in heaven. We must be aware of these biases, and we can work to overcome them. This leads us to a final idea for diminishing the my bad style of actions. We can renew our spirituality by embracing the truth of God in loving relationship to us. We should push away from a flawed theology that believes God has rejected us in holy wrath. In my opinion, this doesn't square with the Bible witness, which describes God acting in reciprocal and loving relationship to everyone. The Bible shows God, in love, does not pull back from people, but works constantly to nurture, inspire, and enliven us, no matter what we've done. We could look to the Bible stories of the call of a pagan man named Abram, to the message of an activist prophet who was always in trouble named Jeremiah, and to the forgiveness of a traitor named Peter. In all of these stories, the scripture tells of God who's always present, loving, and responding, no matter what we've done or thought. We're in a dance of mutual relationship with God, which brings an initial aim of good and growth for every moment. Theologian Robert Rice says this open theism recaptures the biblical portrait of a God who is intimately acquainted with, acutely sensitive to, profoundly affected by, and dynamically interactive with the creatures who bear the divine image. As the Gospel of John says very simply, God's light was the light of all people. There's a loving grace from God that's life-giving for every human being. God has been connected with billions of people since the earliest hominid and is at active work in every nanosecond now to deepen that relationship with me and with you. Now, I believe this perspective can have a profound effect on our choices for good. Psychology has shown that our beliefs are the source of our emotional response and actions. What we have come to think about our self-identity is a foundation for all aspects of our life. Faith traditions are central to our construction of meaning in daily life. For instance, if I develop cancer, it will make a difference if I think God is punishing me or whether I hold that God is experiencing suffering with me. The open theism I described, which trusts God as present and responsive, fosters energy for moral choices and social thriving. Think for a moment about Hensley. She was on a church trip when she contracted a life-threatening infection. Days in the hospital led to months of treatment, and she fixed the blame squarely on God, but she took the anger out on herself and others. She became depressed, she lost touch with her church members who had been on the trip, and she fell into thoughts of great harm. In desperation, she opened herself to talk with a counselor. And theologically, we can believe that this relational God never stopped influencing such an angry young woman toward good. Her beliefs began to shift, gaining wisdom about disease, suffering, and the possibilities of a new life story. With a new perspective, she interacted once again with the people of her faith, and the anger and depression was slowly able to lift with that renewed hope. Hensley experienced this God in loving interaction. Now a movie may have taught us to say, my bad. It's been a laugh line and a semi-apology. 
but acknowledging that I'm responsible for what I do is the foundation of doing better. And faith and science have shown the capacity to make choices for good when we take responsibility and increase our solidarity. Each of us has a long way to go in this journey, myself included. But God is at work within us for health and wholeness.